In this video, we're going to explore how we arrived at a loudness measurement algorithm that works just like our ears, as well as the various criteria we use to define and guide us when working to the new loudness delivery specifications. Following many years of research into how our hearing works and how we perceive sound, together with many hours of listening tests by organisations including the Communications Research Centre and McGill University in Canada, the standard BS1770 was drawn up. Without getting into all the technical details, a K-weighting filter curve based on the research results from all those listening tests basically builds a bridge between our subjective impressions of loudness and the need for an objective measurement that we can use to make comparisons. The K-weighting method is an essential part of the global open standard BS1770 as defined by the International Telecommunication Union and has gone through a number of tweaks so that now we're on version 3. Meters measuring the loudness using K-weighting produce a measurement with a new unit called LUFS, short for Loudness Unit Full Scale, or LKFS, short for Loudness K-weighting. Note that there is not an actual difference between LUFS and LKFS. They are two labels for the same thing and are completely interchangeable. It also helps to use a relative scale so that our target loudness becomes 0LU, making it easier to read the meter, a bit like 0DBU as an absolute measurement and 10DBs being a relative one. Also, it's useful to know that a change of 1LU is equivalent to a 1DB change. When the BS1770 standard was set, they determined how a compliant meter should measure the various parameters, but they rightly chose not to specify how a compliant meter should look. As a result, there are a range of loudness meters to choose from. All BS1770 meters will have a minimum of three loudness measurements, all of which are averages. The first two, momentary and short term, are tools to help us mix content that will be loudness compliant, but they don't normally form part of the delivery specs. Momentary, or M for short, averages the loudness over the last 400 milliseconds, or just under half a second, whereas the short term, or S for short, averages over the last three seconds. The last of these three is integrated, which is an average over the complete program so far. And then at the end of the program, it is this that is one of two measurements that will define whether a program will pass or fail. The other measurement that will pass or fail a program is the true peak level. So what is true peak? With the introduction of loudness metering, peak metering is actually not dead. In fact, because we're working so much closer to digital headroom, we need accurate peak metering even more. We're just not using it as a way of matching programs anymore. Video or film is typically made up of 24 or 25 frames a second. So that's 25 still images. And that means we have no idea what happened between each frame or sample. With digital audio, early peak meters simply took each binary sample in turn, typically 48,000 per second, and used them to light the LEDs in a column-style display. However, these meters are only about 95% accurate. They don't tell the whole story. Because when audio is converted from digital back into analogue, it's possible that when audio is changed through the processes such as EQ or other effects, or when the data rate is reduced for transmission in lower quality formats, there may be audio that would measure above the maximum. So to be absolutely sure exactly what's going on, to measure what we now call the true peak value, requires a meter to read four times faster, so making 192,000 measurements per second. And then we can establish what happens in the gaps. This is really important as we're now working within one or two dBs of digital headroom. 
And true peak readings can be up to 6 dBs higher than looking just at the sample measurements. Because a program can pass or fail on true peak, it is essential that we measure the peaks of the audio using a true peak meter and where limiters need to be used to make sure that the audio never goes above the maximum permitted and that all limiters be true peak limiters too. Coming back to our loudness meter, there is another measurement that BS1770-3 compliant meters take and that is loudness range. So what is loudness range? It's another measurement that we can use in conjunction with momentary, short-term, integrated and true peak and it gives us a measurement of the range of the loudness in a program, sort of how much light and shade there is. Normally a program will not be failed for having too much or not enough loudness range. Rather it's a tool to help us to get a sense of the amount of variation in loudness within a program. The range is described in loudness units and to avoid occasional extreme events from affecting the overall result, the top 5% and the lowest 10% of the total loudness range are excluded from the final measurement. Without disregarding these extreme events, for example a single gunshot or one long passage of silence in a movie, would result in a skewed loudness range. Loudness range is also a useful indicator of potential dynamic reduction processes in a signal chain. Perhaps if a program is also going to be delivered on a mobile platform, it might be necessary to take steps to reduce the loudness range to suit that delivery platform. However, I believe that these judgments are best made by the people mixing the content. I always consider what are the key narrative elements in a program that I'm working on and make sure that they are clearly audible even in the most challenging listening environments like a car travelling on the motorway where the ambient noise is very high. I know that other elements that I add to enhance the narrative won't be heard in the high ambient noise environments but those in a quieter space will be able to enjoy these details as well but I know that the key narrative elements will be audible for everyone. It is essential in designing a loudness meter to understand that the human hearing uses the foreground sounds to determine loudness, usually speech, and not the background sounds like wind or faint music. Because of this, especially on programs with lots of gaps like drama, classical music or some sports like tennis for example, the silences should not skew the average loudness. And so because our hearing ignores the gaps, so should any loudness meter. And this process is called the gate. When the gate is closed because there are no foreground sounds, the meter readings are not added to the overall average for the whole program. One of the parameters of course that a program can pass or fail on. With the gate feature, if the next reading on the momentary meter is more than 10 LU below the average level to date, then it is disregarded and isn't added to the integrated level. This means that pauses don't wreck the integrated measurement. After all, pauses and gaps in a mix are good and give space and room to the mix and at last we don't get penalised for using them. To demonstrate this, and also what happens when the background sound is higher, I'm going to play a series of examples where the gaps get longer between the speech clips. Firstly, without any background sounds, and watch what happens to the integrated loudness and the loudness range. Then the second set of clips use the same speech, but with background sound that is set high enough not to trigger the gate. Again, watch the integrated and loudness range results. This is an example of where we use bursts of speech with gaps in between to see how the loudness meter changes when we expand the gaps. This is an example of where we use bursts of speech with gaps in between to see how the loudness meter 
changes when we expand the gaps. This is an example of where we use bursts of speech with gaps in between to see how the loudness meter changes when we expand the gaps. This is an example of where we use bursts of speech with gaps in between to see how the loudness meter changes when we expand the gaps. This is an example of where we use bursts of speech with gaps in between to see how the loudness meter changes when we expand the gaps. This is an example of where we use bursts of speech with gaps in between to see how the loudness meter changes when we expand the gaps. When we add the background sound, which simulates a sports commentary with crowd atmos, you can see that the integrated loudness drops slightly because as the gaps increase, we have segments of quieter sounds followed by the commentary, which is slightly louder. So the average for the whole program will be slightly lower. Looking at the loudness range, the increase is less marked, but it still reflects the louder commentary and the quieter crowd sounds. Although we have the benefit of one universal worldwide loudness measurement standard, we do have a range of delivery specs around the world. The two major groupings of delivery specifications are the ATSC A85 for US and Canada and the EBU R128 for Europe. There are other delivery specs in other territories like Japan and Australia, but the ATSC A85 and the EBU R128 are the key profiles that most delivery specs are based on. And as you can see from this table, they're actually all very close. The key difference now is 1 dB or 1 LU. ATSC A85 uses a loudness reference of minus 24 LKFS, whereas R128 uses a reference of minus 23 LUFS. R128 specifies a maximum of 1 dB true peak, whereas ATSC A85 specifies minus 2 dB true peak. There were bigger differences in earlier versions of A85 and R128, but now they've converged significantly. For example, earlier versions of the A85 spec didn't specify the gate, but the gate is now in the current version of A85. Here in the UK, all the broadcasters got together and convened the Digital Production Partnership as part of a unified tapeless delivery format, and they included the EBU R128 into this delivery spec. This means in the UK, we only have to produce one mix to one spec for every UK broadcaster, which reduces the multiplicity of deliverables we used to have to produce. And as of October 2014, the EBU R128 is the standard to deliver all UK broadcast programmes, and we no longer normalise to peak level. It makes it so much easier if the delivery specs for all the broadcasters within one territory are the same, as has happened here in the UK. Before we finish, I'd just like to touch on a few misconceptions that have arisen around working to this new loudness standard. Firstly, some people have assumed wrongly that content normalised to loudness has no dynamic range. And I believe this misconception has grown out of a misunderstanding about normalisation. We've got so used to normalising up to a maximum with peak normalisation, whereas loudness is all about a centre of gravity, the average of the whole programme. Of course, to have an average, there must be both lower and higher values, which together produce an average somewhere inside the range between the highest and the lowest.
just as every object has its own centre of gravity, which won't always be in the middle, so every programme will have an integrated loudness figure, the average for the whole programme, but the overall position of that average will vary depending on the shape of the programme. And that's OK. In fact, it's more than OK. It's the way it's meant to be. So to conclude, what are the advantages of mixing to a loudness standard? As audio professionals, we get to determine what a program sounds like and have confidence to know that the program we mix will be the same as the program the consumer hears and it won't be messed about with downstream by any other processing. Because of this, it's really important that there are no black boxes in the TX chain. Now, some broadcasters have been sold a black box that, if inserted into the transmission chain, will make them loudness compliant. Now, in my opinion, they don't work and fly in the face of the spirit of the concept of loudness normalisation and bringing control back to the audio professional. Now we can make programs with more dynamic range, not less, because we no longer need to hit the zero as hard as possible to make our programs stand out. And finally, we're no longer constrained by quasi-PPMs. We calibrate our monitors and then trust our ears. After all, they're the best loudness tools we have. <laughs>